So it has always been a puzzle for Buddhist philosophers to explain how they can at once believe in reincarnation and at the same time deny the existence of an individual spook which is independent of the physical frame. And the most subtle discussions in all Buddhist literature range around this puzzle. How can there be a continuing process without uh, anything carried along by it? And you will recognize at once that the problem is very largely semantic. Because uh, it, it involves our whole idea of continuity. Uh, what, for example, do you mean by a wave? When you see, you throw a stone into the water, and from the plop point where the stone goes in, a whole lot of rings emerge, and they are waves, and they go out. And you can, as it were, look at one of them and follow it. And you say, I am watching a wave. But what is a wave? You know very well that the water itself, the, the, no, no volume of water, no specific volume of water is moving outwards from the place where you drop the pebble. It, the water is staying quite still so far as lateral motion is concerned. But the water is moving up and down. And these up and down movements create the illusion of a thing called a wave that goes along. Similar to the illusion when you watch a barber's pole revolving, it seems to be a procession of something that keeps going up from the bottom of the pole to the top. But actually it's just going around. Now that, that appearance of something moving when there is actually the only thing that is going outwards is motion. And motion is about as abstract as you can think. This is the whole root of the Indian idea of Maya, of the world as Maya, as a construct, as something which, shall we say, exists only in your mind. So here, here, is, here is the point. You are delivered from rebirth this being the purpose of the spiritual disciplines of Hinduism and Buddhism. As soon as you are relieved of the illusion that something is going on, continuity, this after this after this after this, all linking up together into a chain. In the uh, famous Zen text called the Platform Sutra, attributed to Huenang, the Sixth Patriarch, there is a passage which says, If we allow our thoughts, past, present and future, to link up into a series, we put ourselves under restraint. But on the other hand, if we just see that they are not a, they, they, there is just this thought and then this thought and then this thought, uh, you are liberated. This is an idea which is taken up by T.S. Eliot in his poem The Four Quartets where he, you come to the passage where he says that you're getting on a train and you've settled down in the compartment with your newspaper and you're going on a journey. But the one who arrives at the destination will not be the same person who left the platform in the beginning. Because uh, you who sit here now are not the same as the people who came in at the door a little while ago. Just in exactly the same way as the flame of a candle appears to be a constant flame, which we can identify as a thing. But as a matter of fact, it is a stream of hot energy, which is uh, whatever particles, whatever gaseous the molecules are here, are going like this the whole time, flowing upwards and disappearing. The, the flame is converting the candle wax into gas. And in exactly the same way as we can see that the flame has an identity. You say, it is a flame. 
We have a noun for it. Where actually it is a process. It is flaming. And so in, this, in just precisely that way, every human being is a process. Just as the flame is the conversion of wax into gas, so you and I are the conversion of air and water and light and beefsteak and milk into shit. And which again converts into something else, you see. We are the flowing vibration through which all this goes. And not for one moment are we the same. So then, uh, the meaning of the Buddhist doctrine is that you who live today are never going to die. Because the one that's going to die will not be the you that's here now. And likewise, the one that's here now was never born. It goes like this. Uh, it is explained by Dogen, who was a most fabulous Zen philosopher living around 1200 AD, when he said, The spring does not become the summer, and the summer does not become the autumn. No one would say that spring becomes the summer. There is spring, and then there is summer. And he said in the same way, when you burn wood, there are ashes, but the wood does not become the ashes. There is wood, and then there is ashes. Each is, uh, as it were, sufficient to itself. There are, as it were, so steps. It's like vibrations, uh, wave crests, you see, where the water doesn't move, you see. The water doesn't move laterally. So in this sense, by analogy, the spring does not become the summer. But by watching it, you in your mind impose motion on the up and down of the water. And so you say, the spring becomes the summer. So likewise, you say, the baby becomes the adolescent, becomes the uh, man, becomes the crone, becomes the corpse. And the Buddhists say no. These states follow in the same way as the apparent motion of a wave. And so, the, the, the a word to the wise is, live the moment you're in. There is no other place to be. You will not die, and you were never born. If you realize, if you see through the illusion, But you see, in all this, what underlies is the illusion that I am going on, that I constitute a real continuity from this moment to the next moment to the next moment to the next moment. What are you afraid of losing when you die? Why? All the capital you've acquired during your life, the experiences, the friends, the status, the skills, everything that you remember would be destroyed ordinarily when you die. And that's what, in other words, we are afraid of losing the past. Now it's perfectly obvious to me, that when you die, yes, uh, everything that you've acquired as an individual and stored in your brain is dissolved and distributed. But at the same time, it is equally obvious that you are not going to, that when you die, there won't be following the moment of death everlasting nothingness. That would be as ridiculous as to suppose that you went immediately to heaven and joined the saints and angels. 
The point is that when you die, you're always reborn de novo. That is to say, just as you were before. When you came into this world, there gradually arose into being the sensation of I. And it stays there a while, it goes through a development, and then it drops off. But all the time, everywhere, there are other eyes starting up. See? Whether they be human, animal, anything you like. They'll be in other galaxies, etc. Always, they're starting up. Now, we would say, is there, no, there is no connection between them. No, in the same way, there is no connection between the molecules in your hand. And yet you say, it is a hand. But if you look at it under a powerful enough microscope, the molecules in your hand are miles apart. And you would say, there is no connection between them. What's the connection between this galaxy and other galaxies? Well, we can't see any connection. And yet there are gravitational uh, swings whereby they respond to each other and move in a certain collective order. So in a, in a very similar way, the, the, the constant appearance of beings who feel that they are I constitute a wave motion. And they may be considered Individually. See, what we're doing in this I'm not is not setting down a doctrine, but it is the, doing an exercise in perception. You can see it either way. You can see yourself, in other words, as existing only now. That's the only you there is. The alternative to that, logically, is to see yourself as everything. Either it must be that you exist, bingo, like that. You're a point instant, bong. That's one pole. The other pole is the view that all these on and offs, just like the molecules in your hand, constitute a continuous reality. But if you follow that line, you've got to add up not to just what you are at this moment. You're going to add up to the whole universe through the entire span of its existence in space and time. Any middle position you take between these things is arbitrary. Say, okay, I'm going to be so much. I'm going to call myself this particular human being who lives for such and such a time. Okay, that's the way you want to play the game. That's the rules you've been told. And if you want to get attached to that and hung up on that, you're going to say that matters. And so you feel material. And the Buddhist idea is simply saying, don't get hung up on a, what is called in Sanskrit, drishti. Drishti means a view. A particular way of looking at things. You say, that's, uh, looking at it from this point of view, this is the way it seems to me to be, and I'm going to stick for that. I'm going to get hung up on that. That is the meaning of attachment. So, in, in Sanskrit, the word Sakaya Drishti means the view of separateness. The view that the, the, the separation of a certain bundle of wiggles taken out of the total wiggliness of all that there is is me, and another bundle of wiggles is very definitely you, and to get stuck on that, you see, and therefore to start a fight about it, therefore to start crying and weeping and gnashing of teeth all about this thing being real, see, that is what these people are trying, all these Buddhist sages and Hindu sages, to get people off that hang-up and say, wake up, wake up, wake up. 